thank you very, very much for the for the very kind invitation and very kind introduction. Um, I hope I'm visible at the moment. If not, please let me know. Yeah, you are visible. Very good. Your slide and, is also visible. Very good. Very good. So I'm delighted to talk about far from equilibrium universality and about spectral functions in the quark-gluon plasma. And as Ian already said, uh, it will be about classical attractors, so the overoccupied regime. And uh, I will start with some motivation. I will go further to universal classical attractors. Um, and then I will start with uh, recent results or more recent results on spectral functions in mostly gluonic plasmas and uh, on some transport coefficients and some also interesting infrared um, observations in gluonics theories. And uh, finally, I will conclude. Um, so the, these are some references that the talk is based on, but I will also um, write the references uh, on, on the different slides. So uh, let's start with the actual experiment that we try to understand or the, what is the motivation of all of that is, um, which is heavy ion collisions and uh, more precisely uh, those at LHC and at Drake usually because of the, the large energies. And uh, what we try to understand is quantum chromodynamics and especially the quark gluon plasma. Now we have already talked a lot about initial stages and uh, in and and and, and really the, the workshop or the, the meeting is basically about not, is about non equilibrium uh, dynamics of QCD and we will also of course uh, um, uh, focus on that. Uh, what we what we will be doing is we will be discussing the weakly coupled limit the the weak, weak coupling limit or the weak coupling situation and where the uh, gauge fields are initially very large of the inverse coupling and the there's also the occupation numbers are pretty large and to give some um uh some setting uh so yesterday we we heard already uh, very interesting talks by david miller and by zone schlichting um where David actually talked about the classical young mill simulations and uh, the physics beyond it, um, which is the physics of the plasma, uh, which is a, a description of the gluonic plasmas at very, very early times, right after the, the collision or actually the collision itself too. After, after so, so a while of approximately 0.1 or 0.2 Fermi over C, uh, the description turns into an effective kinetic theory and uh, where the most recent compost uh, framework is being used. And uh, the, the underlying physics is this of bottom-up uh, thermalization scenario, which has also been, uh, was also presented by Zern Schlichten. Now, what I will be talking about is actually the overlapping region uh, where both classical young mills theories as well as kinetic theory are applicable. And um, here in this region, the, uh, the, the plasma is over -occupied, highly occupied and uh, has some finite anisotropy and uh, which is around one opened one Fermi over C. So this region has the very interesting um, advantage that not only that, that those lattice simulations are a non perturbative feature that provide some insight that it's difficult to obtain um, otherwise. Um, and kinetic theory, or more generally perturbative perturbation theory, is applicable also in this region, so we can actually compare to some expectations. All right, so let's start with classical attractors. And uh, you can find classical attractors in different, in very, very different physics over, over huge, uh, uh, over a vast uh, difference of different, uh, of, of energies and temperatures and heavy ion collisions at the early universe, models of the early universe, and especially the inflaton models, and in ultra cold atoms. And um, in all of those, uh, what you need is weak couplings, closed systems, and high occupation numbers. And as I said, you have this dual description of classical statistical simulations and kinetic theory, which is a non perturbative perturbative setting. Now let's just flash over classical simulations, which David already discussed very nicely. Um, so in order to set uh, up the initial conditions, uh, you choose, for instance, correlation functions of A fields or E fields. And um, then what you do is, in order to get the dynamics, you solve the classical equations of motion temporal gauge on a lattice and um, in the gauge covariant formulation with link variables. And 
what you do then in, in order to obtain observables is you average over your initial conditions, which looks formally in this way, but basically you just evolve those different fields. Uh, you compute your observable, which is usually oftentimes a correlation function of those fields at the time that you're interested in, and you average over those different ensembles. And we will be interested a lot in the distribution function, which you can write down as a correlation function of E or A fields. Now, starting with high occupation numbers uh, for weak couplings, um, this is just a sketch, but you can, but, but it's really not important how exactly this, the initial distribution looks like. Uh, what is important is that you have some overoccupation uh, up, up to some uh, momentum, typical momentum, which is smaller than the final temperature. And um, what happens is that, the, uh, that those initial conditions lead to a detour uh, before actually thermalizing. Um, and this detour actually approaches, in this detour, the system approaches a classical attractor, which is also called an anthem of fixed point, and it shows universal behavior, uh, which already uh, Shua Jian, uh talked about yesterday. And what you find there is that the actual memory of your initial conditions is partially lost, and uh, you get some time scale independence, and the dynamics is self-similar. So for the distribution function, self-similarity means that usually the distribution function is a function of time and momenta uh, separately, but um, at the self -similar, in the self-similar regime, you get a prefactor, which is usually oftentimes a power law in time, and then a scaling function, which is also universal, which is only a function of one single variable, which is a combination of time and momentum. And those exponents and the scaling function are universal for the theory and for some set of initial conditions. Now, as an example, let's look at the classic attractor uh, in isotropic three plus one dimensional gluonic plasmas. And uh, more precisely, what you find there is you find a direct energy cascade, which means that uh, in this region of this cascade or of this classical attractor, uh, energy is exact is, is conserved, and energy is actually dominated at a hard scale, which is written here and denoted as lambda. And what you find is that. Um, while the occupation number becomes smaller, uh, the typical momentum actually increases with time. And those power laws, which is in this case uh, one seventh, as beta is defined, it's minus one seventh, is universal uh, for different initial conditions. You find this very same um, scaling behavior. Then there is also a soft scale, which is the mass scale, plasma frequency, the biomass. Uh, they are all connected to each other and it decreases with time as t to the minus one seven. So you get an uh, increasing scale separation. And between those, you find actually a turbulent like uh, power law spectrum, which has a form of uh, a power law, p to the minus kappa. And this kappa is connected to, uh, oftentimes connected to uh, actual uh, turbulent turbulence. Now, uh, let us have a look at a different example uh, which is, of course, connected to, to the other one of a two plus one dimensional um, gluonic plasma or non abelian plasma. Here we have no expansion and we have overoccupied initial conditions, but otherwise you could understand it as, as kind of a model of those uh, glasma simulations, which are two plus one dimensional, but just at later times when uh, your launching pressure is positive already. And what you find here, and, and where you have no expansion here. Uh, what you find here is at different times, you again see those different curves. So you see that the occupation number, the distribution function becomes smaller. However, the typical momentum actually moves to the right to higher momentum. So again, you find energy conservation, which is written as here. And energy conservation leads to um, a relation between those exponents alpha and beta. So alpha is basically the exponent of the, of the occupation number. Beta is the exponent how the typical momentum moves. And as you see here, this uh, a, a relation is slightly different, but because we, have, we are in three plus one D, so you get a four here, and in two plus one D, it's a three. Um, then also the, the scaling, re, uh, the scaling uh, exponent, uh, beta, which is again, how typical occupation, uh, sorry, typical momentum move, uh, is slightly different. And the reason here, as it turns out, is that uh, soft momentum um, excitations or soft momentum interactions are actually more important here and uh, they actually change the exponent. So 
how do you see actually that, scale, that there is a scaling relation or scaling law? What you can do is you can rescale your occupation number and rescale your momentum by rescaling basically time to, the, to, to some power. And then you get up, uh, then, then you get this kind of, uh, this kind of behavior where you find the scaling function, which is independent of time. All right. Now let's go to actual heavy ion collisions. And there we are in an expanding metric. So in expanding metric with Bjorken coordinates, tau and eta, um, the, the metric tensor itself is also expanding the longitudinal direction, um, where, which, which is exactly the collision axis. And uh, the distribution function now is a function of time and the transverse and longitudinal momentum. Now, this means that the scaling function is now a function of two, uh, of two variables, and you have again a t to the alpha in the front. Now, how does, uh, so, so starting with the different addition conditions, you find again a classical tractor here. And for vanishing longitudinal momentum, so for pz equals zero, um, you find a very similar picture to the one you saw before, but only with the only difference that beta is not uh, non-vanishing is here, but it's vanishing. That's why you don't see any, um, any movement in this direction. However, the occupation number changes with time and, and that's why you get beta equals zero, alpha is again negative. And uh, when you look at the longitudinal profile, so at some spe specific transverse momentum, you find that also the occupation number, of course, uh, goes down and also your momentum, your longitudinal momentum also decreases with time, then you can rescale both and you find again a universal scaling function. Now, as I said, um, the, one of the main ideas of actually looking at this of overoccupied regimes is to understand more, um, or is, is to compare to perturbative uh, frameworks. And um, when we did that, uh, and it's already been quite, quite, quite a while, uh, um, what we found is that um, you got some specific scaling uh, exponents, which I already uh, told you about uh, on, on the last, uh, on the previous slide, but there were different kinetic descriptions, which were all different in, uh, at soft momentum or the way how they treated uh, soft momentum modes. And, um, the question was, and, and, and each of them also led to some specific uh, set of scaling exponents. And what, what, what we found back then was that the scaling exponents were best described by um, the classic Bayer, Müller, Schaeffer, and Son uh, thermization scenario, which only included uh, elastic and, inel and inelastic scatterings. So no other things like, like uh, instabilities uh, or, or, and, and so on. Um, and, and our simulations were consistent with the first stage of the, of the scenario. And um, this confirmed that the, the kinetic theory only consisting of, of, of elastic and elastic scatterings and with isotropic screening uh, seemed to describe uh, the dynamics of this stage pretty well. And, and afterwards, uh, this kind of triggered even more research in in this direction using the effective kinetic theory. And, and now it's of course a, a standard uh, description, which is also being used numerically as Zurin uh, told you a lot about. But another direction, so, so one direction was uh, really talking about heavy ion collisions, but another direction was actually talking about um, this theory uh, or this classical state, uh, state uh, comp as compared to different um, different theories. And one interesting result was to compare this actually to scalar field theory. So we, we, took, we looked at lambda phi to the fourth theory, um, again, in the same metric, expand, longitudinal expanding metric. And what we found is we found the very same um, classical attractor in some specific suitable momentum region, uh, also in the scalar field theory. So what, you found were, what we found was uh, the very same scaling function scaling exponents um, as for gauge theory. And here you see, for instance, the gauge theory uh, longitudinal profile and the scalar theory profile uh, where the scalar field theory has already been rescaled. That's why you find only a single uh, function. So this actually led to the conjecture of the existence of universality classes far from equilibrium. And uh, this classical attract or this uh, scalar theory is also very interesting uh, because 
not only it um, involves this uh, uh, high, uh, this heavy ion collision attractor, but also at low momentum below the mass scale, it also had um, showed the um, the dynamics of condensation uh, and of a classical infrared attractor, which looks very much the same as for ultra cold atoms, for the inflaton an inflaton model, and so on, which I've written in the backup. So this kind of uh, expanding scalar theory uh, provides a link between the world's hottest and coldest matter, which, which I personally find very intriguing. Now let's go on from the classical attractors to uh, actually understanding what the excitation spectrum of our quark gluon plasma, of, of our yeah, overoccupied uh, gluonic plasmas actually are. Um, and, and one of the reasons is to understand when kinetic theory uh, becomes applicable because it, it actually needs quasi particles and what else of um, what kind of excitations do you actually have in those uh, in those plasmas and uh, at initial stages for instance and um, the main question is well how to obtain uh, excitation spectrum uh, spectra out of equilibrium or spectral functions out of equilibrium and uh, one way to obtain them uh, has already been known for for quite quite a while are uh, is due, due, uh, using perturbation theory, basically the half thermal loop framework, uh, where for thermal for the thermal field theory, which has been done usually, um, is basically um, a resumed perturbation theory in uh, in the coupling, which is given by the ratio of the soft scale and the hard scale, which is the sort of m and the temperature here. Uh, now just as a very small um, review of uh, half thermal loop theory, very, very brief. Uh, so usually you can only apply to, uh, usually you can apply to thermal equilibrium when temperature is very, very large, a lot larger than the uh, um, position temperature, peasant position temperature, and for uh, soft frequencies and soft momenta. But it's also applicable out of equilibrium when the hard scale, which is basic, which basically takes the the part of your temperature in in the out of equilibrium setting, uh, when the hard scale and, and and the soft modes have a, a large scale separation, which means that m over lambda, which is now the new uh, or the effective um, perturbation perturbative expansion parameter, is much smaller than one. And uh, one of the such states where, where this is valid is, well, the classical attractor of isotropic three plus one dimensional theory, which is why we will be using that um, as, our, uh, as our system. And importantly, details of the exact distribution um, are actually hidden in, in the, the, or become hidden in this hard thermal loop framework, at least at leading order, in some parameters, which is, for instance, uh, most notably the mass. So our strategy is to compute the spectral function perturbatively using lattice simulations, how I will, I will show in the next slide, and uh, use, well, the over-occupied system, uh, systems where this kind of ratio is valid and compare the, the, that to HDL expressions, to perturbation theory, to learn uh, some basically, maybe some non-perturbative effects or some effects beyond leading order HT, uh, HTL. Now, um, the HTL self energies at leading order for gluons uh, can be written here in, in terms of the polarization tensor and um, they are related and from there you can actually obtain the retarded propagator which are which look like that for uh, temporal gauge which we also sorry which we also use and um, then you can get the spectral function basically from, from taking the imaginary part of those retarded propagators now two interesting things here uh, one thing is that from the pole of, of, of poles of those retarded propagators you actually obtain uh, quasi particle excitations and the other structure which is pretty interesting is uh, that because you're interesting you're interested in the imaginary part of those retarded propagators uh, you're also interested in the imaginary parts of the self energies and you obtain a, an imaginary part for uh, for the case that x is smaller than one, so which is which means that frequency is smaller than momentum, uh, then those logarithms become uh, complex, and uh, this is called Lando cut, uh, a Lando cut or Lando damping, in this case. So uh, basically, using the mass com computed in such a way, and 
those analytical uh, descriptions of, uh, of spectral functions, we have no free parameters left and one can compare to our simulations. Now, how do we obtain our simulations? So for that, we needed to, um, uh, to derive uh, um, a way to actually compute that because uh, the problem was that, um, that just linearizing equations of motion and perturbing, perturbing them um, seem not to be uh, to, uh, to be good enough because uh, you need to um, um, to uh, you, you needed that the the Gauss law was conserved also for for those linear uh, fluctuations, and this was done uh, in, in 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 this in this reference, and so so what we did afterwards was uh, we actually used those linear uh, fluctuations. In, in the framework that we used um, background fields, so the, the usual A and E fields as background, few classical background fields, then we perturb them in, um, uh, with, with, a, with a specific momentum. Here you see some kind of waves. This is basically a perturbation with some momentum. And then um, we, we, we took the, those perturbations or the response from the perturbation, um, we uh, followed linearized equations of motion for those perturbations and, or for this response. And the response itself uh, could be understood as retarded propagator from which we actually uh, obtained the spectral function. I have a, a backup um, slide on that with more details if you, if, you, if you wish. Now, similar methods have also been used or, or are also used for scalar field theory, um, also especially out of equilibrium. And um, as I, as I told you, we applied this method now for, for, the, for the classical attractor and 3 plus 1 dimensional pl uh, plasmas. And the result is now shown for the transversely polarized spectral function is that, um, so on the left hand side, you see the spectral function for different times. On the right hand side, you see the spectral function uh, in frequency space. So basically for each transforming with respect to, to t minus t prime. And this is, this is a function of t minus t prime of delta t. And you find exactly the, the structure that you would expect. You would you find uh, quasi particle peaks, and we confirmed that they are actually they have actually Lorentzian forms, and uh, you find some um, some broad structure which we could understand as Landau damping or the Landau cut, and especially if you if you see here if you if you, if you find uh, here are those black dashed lines, and those are actually the perturbative expectations of half thermal loops at leading all that I, I showed you before. And those, as I said, there's no, no tuning of those parameters underlying them. Uh, and and you, you find a very nice uh, agreement of, of those non-perturbative real-time data simulations and those perturbative uh, results uh, with several small differences. First of all, uh, you find some narrow width which is of course expected because you, uh, because those uh, co collective excitations, which are those quasi particles, they have a finite uh, finite time, uh, finite life lifetime, and you find some very small deviations in the dispersion relation. So he, this is now the dispersion relation uh, coming from the maxima of those quasi particle peaks, and uh, separately for for the transverse polarized gluons and longitudinally polarized gluons. So the lines and, 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 and dotted lines are the expectations, perturbative expectations from a leading order HTL. The dots are um, lattice simulation results. And you basically, and this is now frequency and, uh, and momentum, and you see that actually the, the agreement is pretty well. well. There are very small deviations at low momentum, but not, not, very, not very strong. And uh, you see that um, that you very clearly see that transversely and and, and that the transverse dispersion and longitudinal dispersion are are different. But when you look at the damping rates so at the lifetime at the, the width of those quasi particles, you actually find that for both for transverse and longitudinal por uh, gluons, you actually find the very same behavior uh, quantitatively. Um, and also the, this whole damping rate, this whole function as, as a function of momentum uh, is interesting also in the sense that uh, it is pretty non-trivial to obtain it non, non, um, in, in half thermal loop 
uh, framework uh, perturbatively because so so what was known was the p equals zero and the p to infinity um, uh, the p to infinity uh, results and values and you 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 see that that actually the p to p equals zero value is in the same ballpark and the p to infinity value has actually huge uh, error bars which I, which is why I don't show uh, the value here but our, also our results are consistent with that. And the reason for, 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 for the huge error bars is actually the magnetic scale, which is not, not non-trivial, not, not, not very non-trivial to um, define out of equilibrium. And um, so what you find here is basically the first uh, determination of uh, the complete damping rate over all the different momentum. And now we can go one, one step for, forwards, and this is now work in preparation. Um, and we can, we can discuss now the gluonic three plus one dimension and also two plus one dimensional plasmas and, and obtain their spectral functions. And uh, so here you see the transverse ones, here you see the longitudinal polarization. And uh, for the transverse polarization, this is now the isotropic three plus one dimensional plasma that I have shown you here. Uh, now here I've shown you only rho, there I show you omega times rho, which is meant by this rho dot. So it's now omega times rho. That's why you don't really see the Landau damping part very well because it's uh, it's basically suppressed. Okay, so you, this is frequency, this is momentum, and you see pretty much the dispersion relation you would also expect. Uh, you see very you see very narrow uh, quasi particle peaks throughout all momenta, and for two plus one dimensional systems, you see a very, very similar situation. Now, uh, the, the main difference is that, uh, um, well, there are several differences. One difference is that it's not a Lorentzian, but a Gaussian shape. Um, then you see that the width is very, very broad. And uh, you also have some finite omega equals zero contributions. But despite all that, you actually still can, can understand uh, when, when you look at the maxima, you see actually um, something which looks narrow enough to say this is something like quasi-particles. Uh, now, this plasma-like two plus one dimensional system, this is uh, not a flux tube uh, condition. This is also over-occupied uh, initial condition, but it's a two plus one dimensional plus a scalar field, um, which is a theory very similar to the plasma. It's also non-expanding, but also here you see um, maybe broader uh, excitations, but still you see quasi-particles for all momentum. And for longitudinal, uh, uh, polarizations, you see maybe a bit more of the Landau damping, but you again see quasi-particles. So what, what does it actually mean? So what it means is that uh, it could be that kinetic descriptions of initial stages uh, could already be valid early on. Um, basically, even during the two plus one dimensional um, evolution, uh, as soon as the longitudinal pressure is, is positive. And um, one of the, of the things we, we would like to do is, and in the future, we would also like to look at spectral functions of the glasma or of situations where the longitudinal pressure is also, has also negative parts in order to see uh, how, much, how, how, how much further we can actually push uh, the limit when two plus one dimensional theories um, show quasi-particle uh, excitations. And um, there are also some interesting results on scalar theories out of equilibrium and their spectral functions. Now, having understood classical attractors uh, or having described classical attractors and also spectral information, um, maybe one of the next steps is to understand what are actually maybe some interesting observables of them and uh, or some phenomena. And one phenomenon which, which is pretty interesting is the transport coefficient, which is here heavy quark diffusion coefficient. And um, another phenomenon is what happens actually at low momenta in gluonic infrared. You, you find gluonic infrared excess, basically. So let's start with heavy quark diffusion. So um, imagine a heavy quark in the midst of, 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 a, of a medium, uh, which, as I told you, is highly occupied. So uh, basically, we again use the, the classical attractor that, that we love and understand. Um, and it, imagine the mass is so large that any motion of the heavy quark is negligible, but it still interacts with the medium and it still obtains some momentum from these interactions. Uh, 
and but but if we neglect basically the um, the response to them, so basically some some recoil, we can just uh, use the approximation that it's only given by a force force correlator, which is just the electric chromo electric field chromo electric field correlator, and uh, this is basically giving your momentum broadening of the heavy quark. Now this momentum broadening. It's, it's, uh, or, or this correlator is actually a gauge invariant uh, observable. And um, as you see, we, we, and, and it can be of course extracted in the, in the numerics. And this has been, uh, this is now shown here. You find three different parts of its evolution. So one very, very early part, um, which can also be understood pretty, pretty, pretty easily in, in terms of decoherence and then some diffusion parts. So usually uh, when you think about how uh, quark, heavy quarks or also quarkonia um, move, you actually set up some Langevin-like uh, so, uh, equations or, or some effective uh, field theoretical equations for them, uh, where you need basically some parameters uh, from, your, from your medium that it interacts with. And one of the parameters is basically the, um, uh, this, uh, the slope here, which is the heavy quark diffusion coefficient. And uh, so basically this increasing here, uh, this increase is basically giving you diffusion of your heavy quarks. But what you also see, and this, is, this has been new, and this is also one of the main points of uh, why I'm actually talk, uh, uh, talking about that, is you also see some oscillations, which are pretty slow and uh, which are on the, uh, which have some period of the order of the inverse plasma frequency. So the, the inverse mass. Now, uh, taking the time derivative of this momentum broadening, uh, you actually get, well, the, one of those in integrations cancels and you get, uh, again, the correlator. And, and, and showing that now, and it's now shown for different times, so for different times t as a function of delta t, well, delta t is pretty, pretty small, basically. And uh, you find those oscillations even more prominently, and you can uh, rescale the uh, the amplitude. You can rescale your uh, your delta t, and you find some self similar uh, behavior also in your um, in this observable, uh, which is nice because we we are, we are talking about classical attractor um, as a, the underlying uh, medium here. But uh, what you also find is that those oscillations actually um, actually occur around a finite value. A constant value, and this constant value is exactly what we understand as the heavy quark diffusion coefficient, which is exactly the slope of this here, basically. Um, now, and this is also the one uh, that, that we use to normalize that. Now, the heavy quark diffusion coefficient is, is shown here on the right hand side for different times, and uh, again, in this out of equilibrium situation. And what, and, and there are several things one can find. So, these are the black dots. Are the um, um, are basically the um, our, our, uh, the lattice results, and uh, this is some fit function that that works pretty well, um, which is which is in uh, in accordance with uh, what one will, will expect perturbatively. Now, uh, what you find is that this heavy quark diffusion coefficient is always larger than the thermal uh, than the thermal uh, value. Uh, unless it actually, unless the system thermalizes, then it actually gets the thermal value. And um, you can uh, compare that to different perturb perturbative uh, methods. And one of them is the spectral reconstruction method, uh, which we suggested uh, for, for, for this way. So basically what, what you do is you look again at this uh, correlation function, you plug in the spectral function that we know from, from previously, from basically uh, uh, the one that, that, that one can extract from the lattice. And, um, and one can reconstruct using the spectral function uh, what, the, um, what the heavy quark diffusion coefficient should look like. And these are the blue plot points or blue dots. And the red dots is using a leading order kinetic theory formula that is known for instance in thermal equilibrium but can also easily be used out of equilibrium. Now, one more interesting thing uh, is that uh, when you look at the correlation function at equal time, so basically when you look at the distribution function, you actually see that um, the EE correlator um, 
has some very peculiar behavior at low momentum be below the mass scale. So uh, this is the, the, the full lines are basically what you can extract from the lattice and uh, from the real time lattice. And you see that below the mass scale, you actually find some enhancement, some infrared enhancement. When you compare to expectations from uh, predictions, from predictions, predictions, you would actually assume, we would actually expect that it should just go up to, up to a constant and not increasing the infrared. So there is a huge uh, difference between, the, uh, between the, the behavior of what you would expect perturbatively and what you, what you actually find in the, in the simulation. And uh, this behavior, this difference is at soft momentum. So um, since we uh, since we already have a, uh, a gauge invariant, and th so so one more thing, this gauge uh, this uh, correlator is a gauge fixed correlator because we we, we look at that in momentum space. So um, of course this could be just an artifact of gauge fixing. However, we can look at gauge invariant observables and, and see if one one finds this um, this kind of behavior in some way in some signature in this uh, in this um, in this gauge invariant observable. And for that, we look at the previous page. And here we don't only show you those full dots, which are uh, where um, in the computation we basically use this full correlation function, but we also show you those open dots. So the red open dot belongs to the kinetic theory and the, uh, the, the open uh, blue dot corresponds to the, to the spectral construction formula. And uh, those open dots actually use this kind of correlator, the, the, the expected perturbative correlator instead of the infrared enhanced correlator. And you find, especially in the kinetic and the perturbative kinetic framework, huge differences um, in those two uh, calculations. So uh, the, if, if you would only use the perturbative, um, the perturbative formulation of your correlation function or your, of your distribution, what you would expect in the infrared, you would strongly underestimate uh, the value of your heavy quark diffusion coefficient. And even more interestingly, you can, you can again look at those oscillating, uh, at, at this correlation function, which, has, which shows those oscillations, uh, which is again a gauge invariant, um, uh, gauge invariant observable, so this, uh, this correlation function. And um, what you see is, you, so the black line, the black curve is lattice data, and uh, you can use diff those different methods to actually reconstruct the curve. So the spectral reconstruction method, um, if you use that with the usual, um, with, the, with the lattice extracted um, correlation function of E fields, shows also those, um, those interesting uh, uh, oscillations. Um, this kinetic theory fails in any way to show that, but this is the reason for that is, and I have to, to probably the reason for that is, I have to, 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 to give it as a caveat, uh, that the kinetic theory that we use here is not, um, is, is, is neglecting some uh, infrared terms. Uh, so that's why uh, you have to take this um, as a, uh, with a salt, of, uh, with a grain of salt. Uh, However, you really, again, focusing on, on, on this spectral construction formula, uh, you can plug in instead of, uh, instead of uh, this, uh, sorry, instead of this curve, you can, you, can, you, can, you can plug in the expected perturbative curve and you see that those oscillations are basically killed. Now, this heavy quark diffusion coefficient can, uh, sorry, this correlator can actually be written as a sum of, of different contributions from the spectral, uh, spectral function. So when you look at this formula, you have basically an EE correlator and you can write this EE correlator as um, the EE correlator at equal times, times times the spectral function and some integrations over that. And the spectral function can be written, um, if I may go back and, and show you again, uh, this spectral function can has a Landau damping part, it has quasi-particle part, and both of them for transverse polar, polarly polarized gluons and for longitudinally polarized gluons. So you have four parts in that. So you can also write down this, um, this uh, correlator as a, as a sum of those four parts, which is written, which is shown here on the right-hand side. So this spectral reconstruction curve 
with those oscillations is the blue one here. And then you can you, you see the quasi-particle curves here, the transverse quasi-particles, the longitudinal quasi-particle curve, both show those oscillations. And the lando damping parts are here and here, the transverse one. So it was known, of course, that the longitudinal uh, lando damping is constant and shows and is basically the main reason why you get the heavy quark diffusion coefficient. However, those oscillations, they actually come from the quasi-particle peaks. And again, as an interpretation, the quasi-particle peaks at soft momenta, they are strongly enhanced in this, in this, for this correlator, which is why uh, you get those oscillations for the, um, for, uh, with plasma frequency. Over here. Kirill, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yes. Maybe we can try to finish in three, four minutes so that we have time for discussions and questions too. Absolutely, absolutely, okay. because I'm almost done already. So I, I need like three, four, maybe five minutes, yeah. and then, then I'm done. So um, what you find is that those oscillations are basically a sign of this infrared enhancement. And, that, and this is just an example of, uh, of, of ways how transport coefficients could actually um, provide some, some, some phenomena or some, some probes of your initial stages that you can, could, could use in phenological uh, treatments of your non-equilibrium coagulum plasma. Now, some, something which is maybe related, uh, but in, let's, let's put it as a, as a different, but nonetheless very interesting infra, uh, uh, phenomenon, is the infrared of, of gluonic theories. And uh, let's start first what, what we know about scalars. So um, in scalar field theory, you have bose einstein condensation and it's an infrared process. You, you see that in non-relativistic and relativistic theories, you see that in ultra cold atoms. And uh, what you find is that you can, you can actually um, define a condensate fraction, which is the fraction of your con condensated um, particles. So those occupying the P equals zero mode uh, divided by the total number of, 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 of your particles. And for different volumes, you see that at first, uh, it grows with the power law and then it, it hits basically your, your volume more or less and then it stops growing, which is, which is a sign of condensation. And now this is a very typical, or this is a far from equilibrium mechanism for condensation of, 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 of particles. And the exponent is, uh, is universal and by uh, rescaling the time, you actually find with, with some uh, condensation time, you actually find a universal curve. Now this, use, this uh, condensation time actually, or condensate creation time is, um, is a divergent function, divergent power law of your volume, uh, which makes also sense because of causality, because the larger the volume, the longer it should take you to condensate. Now, a, the very intriguing um, new result is that uh, when you look at, um, at uh, non-abelian plasmas, and if you use Wilson loops, as a proxy for, for a condensate fraction, you also find a very similar infrared phenomenon. Now, um, it was known that, that, that Wilson loops show some self-similar infrared in evolution in, 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 in the infrared, basically uh, having some classical attractor going to larger distances. And using that, so basically integrating over, over the, with some specific Wilson loops, you, you can define again a condensate fraction which is not the same as the condensate fraction for actual particles, but of something, um, of, of some excitations. But the interesting thing is that, uh, that this condensate fraction behaves exactly the same way as scalar for scalar fields. So for different volumes, you see again, those different curves, uh, the larger the volume, the, the slower um, it actually uh, grows or the, 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 the later it becomes a constant, but you can again, again rescale the time with some condensation time, uh, which is again diverging with, uh, with volume and you end up with a universal uh, scaling form. And even here in the logarithm, uh, log log plot, you also see that it's actually the same one. So uh, even the exponent is the same with scalar, as, as scalar fields. So there, is, there, there are some uh, imminent questions, which is uh, first of all, what is the relation to the uh, formerly seen infrared excess of your um, distribution of your correlation functions, and how is this kind of condensation phenomenon related to actually scalar field theory? And with that, I actually conclude. 
So what uh, I have discussed was over-occupied bionic plasmas at initial stages and heavy ion collisions. I have uh, reviewed some classic retractors that emerge at initial stages uh, and uh, some universality class with scalar field theories. And I have also talked about more recent, um, quite recent results, spectral functions, which disclose relevant dynamics and quasi properties. Um, I've discussed transport coefficients, and one of the transport coefficients at early times has already been uh, discussed by David, jet quenching parameter, and uh, we have now discussed uh, heavy quark diffusion. And uh, they can be large, especially uh, at initial stages, and uh, they can display non perturbative properties. And we have also discussed the fascinating infrared phenomenon. So the questions now are, what are spectral functions now for expanding fermions and gluons, especially at initial stages of the plasma and, and, and related uh, parts of the initial stages? And could one really uh, push the kinetic description at very early times? And uh, can transport coefficients act as probes of initial stages by encoding specific pre signatures? And also the origin for the infrared uh, that, um, phenomena is unknown and uh, it would be interesting to understand how it, they, how it affect, um, affects the dynamics. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Kirill, for this wonderful talk. It's, uh, it's covered quite a lot of things and very exciting things too. So we should now take questions. Uh, okay, so let, uh, there is already a question written by Soren. Uh, can you explain why the Wilson loop should be thought of as a condensate fraction? Maybe Soren can ask it himself. It's better, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, you already asked. <laughs> I mean, you already asked the question. I mean, can you please explain somehow the rationale behind this, behind this measurement, or why I should think of this as condensate? I mean, what is being measured here, and why should it be thought of as some kind of condensate or whatever that is? So the condensate. Um... In, in, in this case is not meant to be the condensate of basically AA field particles, which would you would, uh, would think of maybe as a condensate, but it's also a very um, ill-defined uh, problem what actually gauge, a, a gauge condensate is. So instead, um, this Wilson loop um, can be understood. So, so, so what, what you can write down as the Wilson loop is um, also um, um, at least for large distances, as uh, um, a correlator between polyakov loops or spatial polyakov loops, basically. So those spatial polyakov loops, um, they behave very similarly, the correlator the spatial polyakov loops uh, behave uh, very similarly as this condensate fraction, that, which is called like that, basically. Uh, but uh, what is interesting is that you can, you can go into a specific gauge and you can understand that the, those polyakov loops uh, look like e to be i some scalar field. So there is, you, you can get a scalar field out of that and you can actually uh, even make the, uh, the connection between the scalar field and the A3, for instance, uh, gauge field. So um, this Wilson, uh, this condensate fraction is actually uh, connected to a correlation function between um, Polyakov loops and also between scalar fields in some gauge. And it's still not completely clear uh, to what to um, in, in what uh, in, in what way it actually extends to to what, what we would understand as quasi particles of, of, of gluons. However, what is interesting is that also interesting is that the phenomenon itself looks uh, or shows the same properties as post ancient condensation in scalar field theory. And, um, and the reason for that one of the reasons for that is that here you have you uh, one um, symmetry conservation. There you have a very similar uh, symmetry conservation because of this observable. And yeah, well, now, as I said, the question still remains, what are the details of that description? Why is that so? But uh, there are already, as I, as I also said, some ideas how to connect it to scalar field. But so, 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 so maybe a very long answer to this. So, so maybe first of all, so what exactly is being like? So do you measure a loop which goes completely around or like a partial loop and then then you increase one of the legs. Maybe, maybe just explain exactly. that first very okay. briefly. So, so for, for a specific volume, uh, volume of, of length L, we, we look at, at a fraction C times L, for instance. Okay, mm -hmm. let's say one half times L. Okay, one fine. One fourth yes. times L. And what we change is delta X. So one of, uh, so the other side, which we change that um, for different, yeah, for different spacings. 
then what we do is we integrate over all of those uh, spatial differences. And this is what, what is shown here. It's, it's this integral over volume, basically. Yeah. But I mean, isn't this something like, I mean, if I just say my Wilson loop has an area law scaling and I plug mm -hmm. this in there, don't I automatically get this, don't I automatically get the scaling that you have? Exactly. So this is, this is also, then this I don't, is I also, mean, then I just don't understand how this is related to, to any kind of condensation. I mean, it just means that, you know, I'm long, <laughs> Wilson loop decays exponentially as according to the area at large distances, which is something that we understand without, you know, invoking condensation phenomena or so. I mean, no, so the point is that it's, uh, as you of course know, is that uh, not only you have an area law, but you have uh, actually something which is time dependent. So you have a time dependent area law, if, if you will. Yeah, 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 I know that. Yeah. Exactly. So, so what, uh, what, what is done here is a reinterpretation of this area law in terms of um, in basically recasting it into, into, into a way uh, that, um, that could be okay, so you want to understand the area law scaling of the of the Wilson loop in terms of some kind of condensation phenomenon. That's really what yeah. you want to do. May, yeah. may, may, maybe like that, because because so what you can understand is that this area law is something like an infrared cascade. It's a it's a basically a cascade to larger distances. This is the self similar behavior of this Wilson loop, and um, and an interesting way of also thinking about that would be uh, what kind of effective excitations would they be that are um, underlying this infrared cascade. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree, but you answered my question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay, so the next question is by Hiao Yan. Sorry, I cannot, uh, I probably am not pronouncing your name correctly. Maybe you can ask it yourself. Yeah, okay. So, so is there any, I mean, is, is a self-similarity in uh, heavy cut purely from the electric field? I mean, in your, in your model calculation, I mean, because there will be a contribution from other stochastic forces, like the heavy flavor uh, interacting with the medium itself. Oh, I misunderstand anything. Uh, so the question is why we only use uh, this kind of, kind of correlator uh, in order to get, right. yes? Yeah, okay. Can there be any other? Uh, source of stochastic force that uh, also contributing to this, uh, I mean, momentum broadening and this self similarity. We, I mean, during the heavy cut uh, and the loss. Um, so, so, okay. So, 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 first of all, one one reason why we actually use exactly this correlator is because uh, um, because you have basically it's a force force correlator, and this is basically this is the, the leading the leading contribution. To, to this kind of um, to this kind of uh, of this behavior, so you also get so in here are also color fluctuations or color changes are also encoded in this kind of in this kind of um, behavior um, in this kind of correlation function. Uh, so it's not only the the kicks, but also the the change of basically of color color rotations. Uh, mm. Now all the other flavors are basically. Um, so this plasma that we are looking at is a highly occupied a gluonic plasma. The reason why, why, why it is sufficient to, to look at that at leading order is that the quark uh, excitations cannot exceed uh, an occupancy of, of order one or even of one. Uh, so with other words, uh, when we look at a very, very highly occupied plasma or highly occupied plasma, gluonic plasma, um, then actually the gluonic part dominates because it's of the order of the inverse coupling, which is small. Oh, sorry, which is large because the coupling is small. Uh, that's why the other con contributions, for instance, from kicks of, 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 of quarks and, and, and so on, are, are neglected here. And this is also what, what you basically use in lattice uh, QCD some simulations. Uh, so you can also get that in thermal equilibrium. And uh, there you use a very similar correlation function. To obtain the heavy quark diffusion coefficient. So, so this 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 electric field is actually an external force, right? I mean. These are these forces come from the medium. Uh, from the current point of view of the heavy quarks, it's of course uh, an external source. Uh, yes, but uh, how, I mean, how 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 is this? Uh, I mean, how is this electric field actually depending on the, on the time actually? It's it generated time. dynamically from the simulation. 
So, oh, the, so, the, so okay. the dependence on time is actually seen here, right? I mean, mm. um, I mean, since also the attractor or the, or the medium also changes the time, you also get some changes with time of the transport coefficient of the thiabic quark diffusion coefficient, for instance, or of, of, of other correlation functions. So you see some time dependence because the forces that are uh, underlying here also change with time. Okay. So the medium changes with time, basically the background changes with time, but it's not really a background, it's a, it's a simulation um, of, your, of your gluonic medium. So since that changes with time, and its correlation function changes with time, also momentum broadening, or the way how momentum broadening um, happens to, to the heavy quark also changes with time. Okay, thanks. Mike has a comment. I just a, a small comment uh, because we, we, we very frequently see tildes in theory talks and I just wanted to emphasize that the hard scale is actually given by 2 pi t which is the lowest Matsubara frequency and not t and that factor of 2 pi is super important when you want to try to assess whether the you know the so, there's a scale inversion in the sense that the soft scale and the hard scale have reversed uh, places. Um, yeah, once you put in this correct factor of two pi, you find that the you know roughly the right ratio is g over two pi and not just g. So they don't switch places when g is one; they switch places when when g is order six. Right, but uh, the point is also here that uh, we compare to a non uh, non equilibrium system where the hard scale and the temperature scale. I mean, they are. It's it's just to say that there is a hard scale. And there is, and, and, and the hard scale of the non-perturbative system and the hard scale of the of the uh, of the thermal system are represented by lambda and t, but they are to no to no matter uh, to no, in, in no means they are the same. So also there is maybe some factor of five, some factor of of two or whatever. So in the same way, how we write down that the expansion parameter is m over lambda, uh, of course, what you said is true. Uh, one should be more careful what exactly the expansion parameter is, but then, as I said, then also this expansion parameter gets some prefactors in, in a very similar way. Yeah, there's a prefactor in, in MD and also in land. I just, you know, yeah. when, when people yeah. cook it down and they say, you know, G is one is the dividing line, you know, then I, right. then I, I have to make a statement. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. But, but I, I've not uh, talked about G equal being one. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 here I tried basically to be on the safe side. So, so basically, one, one, one of, of, of the of the of the ideas of of, of getting um, exact of, of of comparing those things uh, at weak couplings um, is to to actually maybe get some means to improve the kinetic description or perturbative descriptions to see some maybe non, non genuinely non perturbative properties that one could also use in other regimes where, for instance, classical uh, simulations are not applicable anymore as in the example of the classical track and heavy ion collisions. So this is, this is the strategy that I'm thinking of when, when discussing this kind, of, um, this kind of idea why we should actually talk about over-occupied systems. Yeah, but this, this, this factor of two pi, you know, gauges a lot of expectations, let's say, right? So if you think really the cutoff line is one and you go do your simulation, you'll be surprised that HTL works so well, right? But right, right. it's in fact that, you know, the scale inversion didn't occur. That is the reason that it's working so well. That, that, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Okay, so since I don't see any further question, I have two, two questions actually. The first one is probably very naive. Uh, so as Mike commented, or as, as Mike asked Dev David in the previous talk, there is a, the scale dependence cancels between uh, hard scatterings and the soft scatterings. Uh, it's how exactly it is happening in your calculations in the context of this momentum diffusion? The scale dependence uh, in time or momentum or? Uh, in, in the scale dependence in, in, the, in the cutoff, I mean. Uh, so there is a lattice cutoff for the- uh, Oh, for the, oh. L and and then yeah. there is this cutoff with the, for the momentum for the hard scatterings, uh, infrared cutoff, and they cancel each other out, right? Okay, so, 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 so here, uh, one reason why we actually use the classical attractor for that is that because we, we had full control on, 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 this, on this system. And one 
one way of understanding what kind of full control we had is, or we have, is that um, uh, this uh, um, that we can basically go to very very small lattice spacings. We can avoid lattice artifacts. But let's let's put it like that. So we have actually full full control over lattice artifacts, or almost full. We can achieve very good control over lattice artifacts. So why the, why this is, why this why this because, happening? Because because you have here two scales. So usually in thermal equilibrium, you have only one scale, which is either lattice spacing or the temperature. Uh, out of equilibrium, you can actually have two different scales. One scale is, for instance, your let, let, let's get get back somewhere here. One scale is basically your hard momentum, p, and the other scale is your temperature scale. The let finite finite temperature scale, so, so final temperature scale, which is something like the inverse lattice spacing. So if you prepare your system in such a way that your typical momentum scale for your hard particles, for the interaction of your hard particles, is way below the temperature scale or way below the lattice cutoff scale, then you are actually pretty safe, and you can actually use whatever lattice spacing you you want. Um, or you, you can actually go to very, very small edit spacings and uh, you will not, and you will avoid um, basically your, uh, any, any um, cut, lattice cut of artifacts by doing this this way. It's, it's kind of a continuum limit. And this is, this is possible because we are out of equilibrium because you have a different dynamical scale. So basically this different scale uh, is kind of an add on on your theory. Uh, that's why also in when, when looking at observables like the heavy quark diffusion coefficient or other transport coefficients, um, which are dominated by this dynamical scale of your tractor of your of your system, non-equilibrium system, it's safe to say that um, also lattice artifacts can get under um, under control. On contrary, when you're in thermal equilibrium then you have only a single scale, which is also when, when you look at classical, uh, classical simulations in thermal equilibrium, you are in the Rayleigh Jeans problem where your lattice uh, spacing, when you go to zero, actually um, your, uh, your theory becomes not well defined because classical thermal equilibrium diverges basically uh, yeah. okay. in, in, with, with this problem. That, that, that's when lattice artifacts come in. Uh, for the glass one, there is a different problems. So the initial conditions are different from, from, from the ones we, we use here. We have here a specific lattice cutoff, oh sorry, a specific mm -hmm. momentum uh, until which everything is basically, um, until which we understand our system and, and mm -hmm. our system. Uh, the glass is a bit more complicated, but also there you can, you can go to small lattice spacing if you, if you do it in a controlled and correct way. Thanks a lot. I always had this question and never found the answer. <laughs> okay. okay. And uh, so I have a second question. Uh, it is, uh, so you discussed a classical attractor, but uh, suppose in scalar or in field theory or in a, where you have some large end of expansion, can you not also find it uh, in, in, uh, in full, the full quantum theory using 2PI? So one interesting thing could be to understand what is a new kind of fluctuation dissipation relation you should get. Uh, in this non, uh, if it exists in the first place, still exists in the full quantum theory. Yes. So, so things like that have been already done or, or have been have been discussed. So, uh, just just for those who, um, course you might want to go who, to higher who, order in expansion and gradients um, to to have a, a better description on the freeze out hypersurface. Um, and uh, and but is there a way to test uh, what? prescription that you use at freeze out um, against something, you know, QCD based. And uh, beyond that, um, if we had so, an understanding of, of how to do this uh, freeze out better um, at any moment in time, can we then uh, construct hydrodynamic uh, frameworks that more accurately describe QGP thermalization and apply them to, to phenomenology? Now, of course, uh, the tool that I'm going to use today, well, not of course, but the tool I'm going to use today is, is effective kinetic theory. And, and Soren uh, gave us a very nice introduction this morning uh, to that. Um, now, of course, you could say, well, why not just get rid of hydro and then just use effective kinetic theory everywhere? Sorry. It's much harder. Oh, okay. What happened? Sorry. Uh, so Mike was playing his talk somehow. 
<laughs> okay, no, <what> sorry. <laughs> ah, okay, sorry, sorry. I, I thought it was a comment by Mike. I'm so sorry. That's why I was patient too. That was it my was fault. Re- it was replay of I his stop. I on the wrong link. <laughs> so I was sorry, having a deja vu. Uh, it was actually yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so to, to your to your question, Ayan. <laughs> sorry, I was also a bit confused. Uh, so there is a, for instance, in in scalar field theory, you have uh, this this also prominent, interesting infrared attract, classical attractor there, where you have an inverse particle cascade. And indeed, uh, for classical the- uh, for sorry for scalar field theory, you can also you can use two pi equations of motion. Uh, you, you can use a 2PI framework to understand this regime. So you have basically uh, particles being, uh, being pushed to low momenta, which is also the, the, the mechanism be behind uh, Bose-Einstein condensation. Now, um, uh, they have been simulated. I'm not sure if I actually have. No, I don't see. So um, the references are by Linda Shen and Jürgen Berges. They actually used 2PI equation, uh, so the 2PI framework in the one over n expansion in order to obtain, um, in order basically to, to, to obtain the spectral functions of, of this regime. But you can also use that, uh, you can also use classical simulations for that. And this is for instance something that, 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 that we did with us here. Um, and um, so the difference is the following. When you use something like 2PI one over n expansion, then you restrict yourself to some kind of truncation, which is the one over n expansion. It's a resummation, of course, it's an infinite number of, of diagrams that we resum. You can think about that of a, of, as a kinetic theory with an, inf- with an infinite resummation of, of, of diagrams. However, then you miss lots of topological or vortex related um, effective formulations of your system. And, and you, you can see that uh, why it is so important to still also use despite of 2PI or kinetic theory, why it's still so important to use classical simulations, for instance, some real-time uh, lattice simulations, is uh, at, at the example of the ON symmetric uh, scalar field theory, where, um, as I said, you have this very interesting, this, this, this kind of attractor, which is the same for, looks the same for the distribution function for n equals one, two, three, four, whatever, for non relativistic theories, for expanding theories, whatever, you, you just t- say a theory and it's basically, it has scalar theory and it has basically this kind of attractor. However, when you dig into that and you think about, for instance here, ON theories for different N, you actually find that this huge universal uh, universality for all N actually has two different processes behind that. So you have for N equals one, some non lorentzian peak with very different properties from uh, the situation where you have n equals three and larger, which is exactly the one over n peak. And this is exactly the peak, the Lorentzian one over n peak that you also find for um, when, you, when you use uh, your 2PI one over n ex- uh, expansion framework. So you basically miss this kind of peak when you use 2PI one over n expansion, which is fine because it's a, uh, this is just n equals one and equals two shows again, different stuff. But when you, when you think about kinetic theory, and, and you use one over n as a uh, expansion parameter, well, you miss parts of that. Um, this is again, maybe one of the core messages, I hope one of the core messages of, of, of my talk that uh, you need exactly this kind of um, comparison between uh, non-perturbative lattice simulations, especially out of equilibrium and, uh, and, and, and kinetic theory of other perturbative uh, uh, or, trunc- or other truncation schemes in order to get more physics out of your system. Okay, thanks a lot, Kirill, for this nice talk. So 